Thank you very much. Soccer is a step in the right direction. That's my thought. Well done. Um, okay, so this has been a fabulous, well, it is being a fabulous Guy 19 uh, program. Uh, we've just had a very um, interesting conference um, on certain aspects of the problem of, well, what is the galaxy and where has the galaxy come from? Um, the sorts of topics that were discussed, I've listed to the left hand side. Um, we talked about non axis symmetries, system response, CDM hierarchy, galaxy model building, uh, probes of dark matter, and if I have a chance to develop the, the future, what this field holds in store in the years ahead. Now, I saw in this morning's uh, science news stories that uh, there are two. Uh, excited meson states discovered, and, you, and the Large Hadron Collider teams had to sift through vast amounts of data to find a few kernels of proof. Um, and that always warms my heart because I think most fields of physics degenerate into enormous complexity. Um, Freeman Dyson often says that particle physics is the only field that sort of evolved to simplicity. But I think since the, uh, the creation of these large machines, you're back where we are in astronomy wading through enormous complexity looking for kernels of truth. I, I thought I would start, if I have a chance, if I have the opportunity, I would like to talk about these things, when is galaxy formation solved, um, and why should physicists care, which is specifically about dark matter, possibly even dark energy and particle states. Um, but let me start this topic by giving you a little story. Uh, um, Wynne Evans accused me of telling fairy tales, probably right. Uh, but I want to get to the point of uh, KITP Cavalier's impact on the story of our galaxy, understanding our galaxy, had a very important uh, impact. Um, well, it continues to do so, but there was a seminal event in the early 80s. So let me start with this one, this figure here, which tries to give you a sense of what is the galaxy when we thought it was essentially axisymmetric and where the different components and how they were found over many years. Of course, we knew about the blue bits, the LMC and the SMC, um, the Milky Way disk um, for, well, I suppose you might say thousands of years, if you believe what historians say about Aboriginal art. Um, and right, LMC is large magnetic, large magnetic cloud. It's, that's why the southern hemisphere is so much more interesting. <laughs> and why we never managed to land a Kavli Institute in Sydney for conversations David will remember. Um, so but you need to be in the south, looking up at the galactic bulge, the galactic center. You need to be looking at the LMC and the SMC. These are dwarfs that go around us that were in full over four billion years. Um, so as far as we knew, up until 1960, everything was very axisymmetric. So the Milky Way and the LMC and the SMC, you'd have to say that they weren't understood as galaxies until the Shapley Curtis debate in 1920, and the discussion began to focus much more on what these things were. Uh, of course, uh, Galileo, uh, moving quickly after Hans Lippershey uh, was trying to patent his technology, knew about uh, things like stars and star clusters, that the Milky Way was things that were uh, replicating many times over, but at different distances. Um, and that's been a long story. But I think the realization of what we're in took a long time. Emmanuel Kant and others talked about us being in a flat disk of stars. Um, but anyway, uh, so the, really, it sort of, the field really took off, I suppose, after 1920. The next important thing that happened, um, well, you might say uh, Fritz Zwicky in 1933. I'll come back to that. You might even say uh, Charles uh, Babcock in 1939. I'll come back to that as well. But they were not really understood for the importance of what they were observing. But the really important step, I suppose, the first of the steps was uh, Walter Bader recognizing that there was actually a stellar bulge around the galactic center. Um, uh, the the uh, nucleus, the center of the Milky Way, was not discovered until 1951 by uh, Pinnett, uh, Pittington and Minet in Australia, radio astronomers in my department, in fact. And when you look at their nature paper, the coordinates are out by 29 <coughs> degrees in longitude. You have to look at that paper. So we didn't know until 1951, and some of you might even remember the result uh, in the audience. Um, and so the IAU moved very quickly to accept that as the galactic center in 1954. 
Um, then after that, uh, Nancy Grace Roman deserves full credit for recognizing the stellar halo. She found metal poor stars moving very oddly in relation to the disk stars, which had lots of rotation. Uh, 1956, a seminal paper by Lai Spitzer. We don't talk about gas in this conference, but he made a very simple realization, which was he saw puffy white clouds like cumulus clouds in the halo, and he said, just very simply, that the product of NT cold, these clouds are being held together, is of order NT warm. He had a guess about the various ionization states, the cooling states that might exist, twiddled NT hot. So basically, um, the amount of warm gas you would need to pressurize and keep these clouds together uh, was, was just too weak. We do see it today, of course. So he inferred that there was a hot coronal component uh, that keeps these little cumulus fluffy clouds together long before UV and X-ray satellites that came along in the late 60s. So a rather brilliant uh, realization on his part. Then after that, um, you'd have to wait until after 1960. Now, 1959, right before the, uh, the, this era ends, there's a paper by... Kahn and Vulture that use the idea of timing mass. You see the LMC and the SMC, sorry, the LMC, sorry, the Milky Way and the Galaxy have relative velocities. As of last year, we actually see the full 3D space motion of uh, M31, M33. And what they, what he realized, Kahn and Vulture, an amazing paper, has essentially four papers in one. They realized the timing mass of the galaxy that there was there was evidence for some missing or I suppose, unobserved component. It could be gas. I suppose it could be brown dwarfs, given what they knew at that time. Um, but the connection between Fritz Zwicky, uh, Babcock's rotation curve for M31, and uh, the timing mass of the local group uh, was not made until much later. Now, after 1960, things began to develop in terms of detail. At the, I suppose at the time, lots of people were thinking of it as weather. It ends up not being weather. It ends up being the response of the system and profound clues about the nature of our galaxy. The first up, I suppose, were the spiral arms and the outer warp by radio astronomers. Um, and uh, essentially, lots of uh, individuals take credit for that. It was a really messy time. In terms, they, they, they defined the inner disk as being very thin and cold and flat. They could see these perturbations, and then they could see deviations from this flat plane. Gum in 1960, I suppose, was, the, was one of the first, but it took off uh, after that time. The next result, I would say, is that um, uh, band, um, uh, de Vaucouleurs um, inferred that we must be a bar-like galaxy. He knew that we had the bulge, of course, from Bader's work uh, and made some inferences, uh, and that was detected cleanly and clearly in the 1990s. Um, part of the, uh, Otto and Gerhard is part of that very uh, important history. Um, after that, I suppose you might say the 1970s were very important. Um, the uh, astronomers were seeing flat rotation curves. People like um, Vera Rubin, Ken Freeman, um, Albert Bosma's thesis was particularly important that there was something missing uh, from the uh, halos of galaxies. But again, amazingly, Fritz Zwicky's work is not referred to by any of them. Um, it's essentially an unsighted piece of work all through the 70s. And the citations took off in the mid-80s. I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, and even classic papers like um, Ostreicher, Peebles, and Yahil, which was a brilliant paper in terms of uh, looking at binary galaxies, looking at what we knew about the timing mass from Karn and Vulture. But again, the connection to Zwicky was not made. Um, Sandy Faber deserves full credit, Faber and Gallagher, 1979. That was, a, I suppose, one of the first reviews uh, to remember um, in the context of uh, uh, Ostreicher, Peebles, and Yahil uh, that the Zwicky work uh, was very important. And then in the 80s, of course, the CDM uh, framework, the cold dark matter framework, began to take off. So if Zwicky's work was ignored and no one paid attention to it, how can you call that important? Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose what it would need, it would have been important if we had the CDM framework earlier, I imagine. The CDM framework, the association of the cold dark matter hierarchy was ultimately connected to an important conference at Yale 979. In Yale 1979, Searle and Zinn uh, were presenting results of globular clusters. And they, they were thought to be, and they probably are, accretion events. And they have a range of ages in the halo, which argued against Egan, Lindenbell, Savage, uh, Savage 
sandage um, of a monolithic collapse. Right. So, so that connection I, between right, the clusters but, and CDM began to be important. And then the connection was made. But Fritz Wicke published this 1933 paper in yeah. a completely obscure place. And, right. when, and when he published a version of that paper in, the, in an AFJ or AJ, one, you know, a, a reputable journal, he did not include the, the, the dark matter in it. It was just the you know, burial theorem in it. So I don't. So that's I, not I, a bad insight. Any for the benefit of the other program, can you say what Fritz Wicke's result is? So Fritz Wicke, I apologize. He looked at, um, I think it was the Virgo cluster? Coma. 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 Coma cluster, thank you. Coma cluster and looked at the motions of, um, I think his plot had a thousand data points, something like, some enormous number of galaxies. And their random motions uh, were much higher, hundreds, possibly even a thousand kilometers per second, much higher than what was expected given the amount of light. We knew what the, you know, the mass and the light from the sun gives you a mass to light ratio. So you can use that over an entire galaxy and figure out the masses of all these thousand points of light. And the amount of random motion uh, was uh, much higher than was anticipated from the amount of mass from starlight. And so he talked about dunkel materiel, dark matter. Um, and that result essentially, I mean, I, I take your point, but a historian would have to... But the errors were... See, my question is whether he believed that result. I see. That, because yeah, it's so a fair comment. Large. So uh, to actually um, back up what Bucky is saying, if you look in Sicky's book, Logical Astronomy, he describes this result and he gives five possible explanations, one of which is dark matter. It yeah. isn't clear to me, like it isn't clear to Heidi, that Zwicky thought that was even the most probable. Yeah. And so I, it, it, That's it a bothers, fair comment. It bothers me a lot that Fritz Zwicky is, is uh, cited over and over and over as the discoverer of dark matter. But he was only even noticed as a thing after Vera Rubin found the rotation curves of galaxies. Yeah. And, and that's astounding to me that he would get the credit for something that she discovered. I take your point. <laughs> and also to associate their unscaled to galaxies, which is a big jump. <laughs> All right. So, no, no. Actually, when you, if you look at, if you, if you, if you talk, no, no, no. To be fair, to be fair, if you talk to, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Heidi to, to, we need to move on. Yeah, we do. I, I want to come back to. We're not going to resolve the history of astronomy today. There's um, uh, absolutely not. Thank you. You're absolutely right. So there's lots to be said on that. And not so so uh, moving forward, uh, what I would like to say, uh, which is crucial to realize, is that this. The Kavli Institute had a fundamentally important meeting where a lot of the players, the theoretical players and, and the early simulators came together and talked about the hierarchy of dark matter and they made the association with galaxies uh, accreting lumps over billions of years sort of um, in, the, in the way that we know now as a CDM hierarchy. And if you look at the, um, and that was 1984, I think, David? And if you look at the citations, 85, 86, they just take off. Uh, regardless of whether you think the association or the um, attribution is correct or not. The Galway Institute. At this point, at this, so at this point here, galaxy models and galaxies were understood to be somewhat axisymmetric. axisymmetric and at this point here, um, the importance of non-axisymmetry uh, came to be uh, fully realized. So let me keep to time by moving on, um, specifically with reference to this meeting. So the bar, the spiral, and the warp. Um, some might think of these as weather-like phenomena. In actual fact, they're responses of the system. The warp in particular, we don't know fully what causes this. This could be associated with the changing axis of accretion of material onto the galaxy. Uh, or it could be something like the tumbling dark matter halo, that the simulations show that the, the dark matter halos tumble through like a radian over a Hubble time. Um, and that can also give you this uh, warp-like structure, whether it be triaxial, overlay, or even prolate uh, shape to the, to the underlying halo. The uh, spiral arms, um, are, there are many ways to get to spiral arms. I should also say that they're all implicated as being important. Bars fueling the nuclei of galaxies and the AGN phenomenon. Spiral arms are also implicated in star formation, although no one really understands how or why. There are Papers by illustrious individuals that say that the spiral density wave 
if it exists in the way that we think, stuff coming in within co-rotation that falls into the spiral arm potential just gathers up. It gathers up clouds or gas. It gathers up, maybe even just gathers up star formation. The stars already are formed, but they're gathered up by the arm. There are lots of different approaches to that question. Whether it's driven by self-gravity and the gas and or stars uh, is a very important question. And Jerry Solwood uh, has worked on this topic for many years. Something else about spiral arms, which is interesting, is it seems to be a natural response under any situation, any kind of um, um, M, M equals 1, M equals 2-like uh, component. You can have a, a passing uh, satellite. Um, you can have just noise in the disk itself, and uh, like little swing amplifiers, and they build up to give you this M equals 2 mode. So it's, uh, spiral arms are a very difficult issue to resolve. And, and in Binney's talk and some of the talks we had in the last few days, uh, we talked about whether spiral arms are long-lived or whether they are, in fact, transient. This is very important in terms of what they are. I suspect the, tra the consensus today is that spiral arms are transient uh, rather than long-lived. They sort of rise like a wave crashing on the beach and then fizzle out. And when they fizzle out, it lost its integrity and differential rotation just shears the material away, <coughs> winds the material away. Uh, time scale for uh, depends what component... Uh, possibly less than rotation period. Would you would you agree with that, Jerry? So 100 million years, the spiral um, arm phenomenon. Typically, uh, you know, a few galactic rotations. So it could even be of order um, 500 million years. Yeah. But the idea now is essentially that these spiral arms they sort of build up. Let's say, for example, that dense gas is falling in. They build up. Then the dense gas forms stars. The stars feed back into the gas, and it all dissociates and the phenomenon uh, possibly fades away or even rebuilds uh, soon afterwards. But the idea is that at some point, that figure, because of differential shear, has lost its integrity and starts to wind up. And I'll hopefully get to a point about Gaia, the new Gaia, the Gaia satellite observations, on the issue of transients. Um, and uh, so the, uh, I've mentioned the warp. The bar is, uh, uh, is quite uh, remarkable. Um, so... Uh, the bar itself, there's um, evidence. Um, Otto and Gerhardt gave a, a, um, an amazing talk on the three-dimensional structure of the bar, and even to the point where they now think they understand the pattern speed of the bar, rotating at a certain speed, uh, and that could even drive uh, resonances into the disk. Now, if you look at Gaia, the, the Gaia satellite, what that's seen in the local disk around the solar neighborhood, it's seen something like this. If you plot the tangential motions um, like this versus the, um, sorry, this is the radial motions against the tangential motions like this. So this sort of, put a number like 250 kilometers per second here, put a number like zero here. And what they're seeing um, before, well, actually, Hipparchos satellite saw it first, but you might have expected some kind of Gaussian cloud with a skew on it. That's because stars at high are, are in the plane rotate rapidly, but as you lift them off the plane, some of the energy goes into pumping the orbit vertically, and they start to uh, delay sort of, um, uh, with respect to the underlying rotation. In fact, that's not what was seen. What was seen was something which was highly structured, first by Danon and Hipparchos, and now by these amazing new Gaia observations released recently, last year in April. So what you see now are a series of clumps Maybe some of these are moving groups or moving systems. There's some kind of beautiful break in here. And then this is what is called a stream in here. And this break um, has been modeled by a number. of actually a, um, another component, <coughs> very, very faint. Uh, and this break has been modeled uh, in terms of the driving influence of the bar, a resonance uh, due to the bar. So these are all stars within what distance from the sun? Yeah, these are all stars that are within, I think, this. 200 pulses. Yeah, within, well, okay, let's stick with that for now. Yeah, this is the local, actually, no, it's a volume which is quite, it's sort of 200 parsecs this way, but a kiloparsec that way. So it's sort of a, a cylindrical volume. Well, Hipparchos was very local, but what's seen by Gaia is slightly larger volume. And just to remind everybody, the thickness of the disk, the distance to the galactic center of those units. Right, okay, that's very good. So the um, thickness of the disk, this component here, is plus or minus 300 parsecs. That's the scale of that disk. This thick disk is plus or minus about a kiloparsec. And our distance from the galactic center, this distance here, is now known to 0.3% accuracy from the ESO gravity measurement that came out at the end of last year, is 8.125 kiloparsecs. 
So that's now known as near, that, so that's our so most important the number. Of galaxy to, to, what? <coughs> to us, yeah. Our, from from here to the center of the galaxy, uh, we're using the VLT, this isogravity interferometer, is an amazing experiment. That's now known, as I say, to 0.3 percent. So where are we in that map? Sorry. Where are we in that? Sorry, map? I should have explained earlier. There is a dot, a red dot here. That's the sun. <laughs> you are here. <laughs> Fortunately for you, it's a quiescent environment. You, I wouldn't give you much chance if you were living in there somewhere. So. Well, in, that, in the other map? Hmm? Yeah, so that. So we're close to this little spur next to the arm. So we're here, just above, just inside of the arm. So, uh, gosh, you could spend. You had great fun with cartography, couldn't you? Just going through all the levels of knowledge we have on. Okay, so what I didn't mention about the spiral arms is if you take V phi, uh, sorry, if you take V phi, and look what the Gaia has now seen. This is new to Gaia, to be honest. I mean, its little bits have been seen by others over many years, but the really overwhelming evidence comes from Gaia. If you plot radius from the galactic center, let's say we have four kiloparsecs here, maybe 12 kiloparsecs here. Okay, so we, we the sun, we know we are sort of in here somewhere, eight kiloparsecs. And then you plot that against V phi, so, um, and, that, and put again 250 about here somewhere, now, you all know that the rotation curve of galaxies, you mentioned Vera Rubin before, uh, and others, uh, the rotation curve on this scale, zero is down here somewhere, it goes up like this, and at some point it goes flat. It sort of would, would do this and goes flat on you. That's what gas would do. But the stars don't. The stars have a little bit less than that. The stars have all families of orbits. They're highly eccentric, highly uh, and radial. They can be very circularized. Um, and, of course, they can be slowed because as they lift off the plane, energy is going into the vertical stuff, so you've lost the, um, your amount of um, uh, speed that you have, circular rotation you have in the plane of the disk. So what you would see with stars is a sort of a general uh, distribution like this, all sorts of uh, orbits. Some of them are circularized. You probably could find stars that track the rotation curve, uh, but they're all families of orbits because uh, stars have every, uh, all sorts of complex shapes in 3D, the orbits, I mean. Now, what they discovered, which is quite spectacular, are a series of these thin ridges. And we have been quite a lot of discussion in this meeting. And they do seem to track um, equal amounts of angular momentum. Um, I remind you that I was five minutes late starting. Oh, sorry, that wasn't your work, sorry. <laughs> um, and some of them go off, sorry? Some of them go off like this. These could be equal energy or orbit frequency. I mean, you can, you can interpret them in terms of whatever you want. But the point to be made is that it's very simple, actually, now to run a model. You could do it yourself to, to demonstrate this is true. Um, and if you were to plot um, um, uh, configuration space, x, y, sp the spatial domain, and put a spiral arm in there in a realistic potential, and then watch how it wraps up with time and to the point where it wraps like this, and plot that, you generate these sorts of ridge-like structures from a spiral arm that is wrapping up. A number of people have made this comment during the course of this meeting. So it could be already that we have preliminary evidence of transient spirals independent of all the other arguments that have been made over the years. Um, so let me move on, because there's so much other good stuff to tell you about that's coming out of these, of these various missions. OK, let me talk a little bit about system response. One of the most spectacular results um, has been the, and this is, again, the response of the system. I guess I could try to squeeze, so, so, to avoid confusion, maybe I should just get rid of this one. So I suppose the one that wowed many of us uh, was the, um, the uh, detection of the following. It's this sort of volume here. It's the small volume. This is, this is a very big volume, kiloparsec scale. This is 100 parsec scale. So this is the small volume stuff. So in the small volume with the Gaia satellite, um, someone had the wit to plot the following. Um, so this is the, the vertical axis of the disk is uniformly known as Z, not to be confused with redshift. It gets very confusing if you're talking about both in the paper. So if you plot Z against VZ, you know that for a harmonic oscillator, you know, you know full well that that would be... Um, at least in the harmonic uh, part of the oscillation, you know that that would look something like this. Um, um, and, but what's seen by uh, the, uh, the 
the Gaia satellite is now over a large, um, this regime this is plus 80 kilometers per second, minus 80 kilometers per second. Uh, this goes something like, I think, mine, or maybe up 60, put that 60 here. And this is like minus one kiloparsec plus one kiloparsec. There was an extraordinary result, which was um, of a this of a spiral. Uh, I think it's this way around. Here we go. That looks something like this. And a number of people, um, like uh, Larry Widrow, Catherine, uh, and uh, uh, Chervin Laporte, uh, talked about these spirals in the context of a disk which is essentially oscillating and settling. Um, now, just to distinguish that from the spirals in this yes. plane. Why don't you call it a snail shell? Which, which yeah, okay, the snail bad. snail shell. Yeah. <laughs> So we called it in the language of phase space, a phase spiral, as in phase mixing, phase wrapping, and so on. Um, or, so it's a, fa a spiral in phase space, for sure. It gets called the snail for, uh, I suppose, fairly obvious reasons. This is vertical axis against vertical velocity. And you see clear what looks like incomplete phase mixing. It's sort of a, it's a, sort of a very simple mental picture, which doesn't really transport too well. You can think of dust of sand grains <coughs> bouncing on a drum skin, and then someone bashes the drum skin, and some set of those dust, uh, sand grains uh, uh, become coherent and then fall back and settle. Um, but anyway, um, and those sort of turn, turnaround points become ridges in phase space. So if I was to draw that for you uh, onto the galaxy, Put that onto the galaxy now, the galactic disk. So here's the galactic center. And we draw this, make this very long to make this point clear. And this has now been seen in the Gaia survey, in particular the MOST team, um, and Apogee and Galar and so forth, who've worked on this. If you're, if you're near the galactic center, that spiral has this sort of look. It's sort of very elongated in... Um, uh, in the Z direction. Um, if you're at the sun, this is, these are arbitrary coordinates, but it's very elongated because of these, these strong surface gravity of the disk in this direction. At the sun now, it looks, well, it's been plotted to look circular in that, that formal plot. It looks nice and circular. As you go further out, it elongates the other way because now the vertical motions are less um, and this, it goes like this. Oops, sorry, and, and in fact, because it moves more, the frequencies are more slower, it has fewer wraps. So I actually haven't done this justice. The number of wraps determines what, it is determined by you are in radius and the vertical amplitude compared to the radial uh, Z extent. So these extraordinary spirals are actually seen as you move out in radius, which shows you then that spatially what's going on is some, as uh, Larry Widrow refers to this as galactic seismology, this is a response of the system to a strong perturbation. So what you've got then is something like this. You've got some kind of a corrugation like this, which then just builds as you go further out. Maybe it becomes the warp eventually. Uh, I've exaggerated the vertical scale, and this would go the other way. So maybe, maybe this becomes the outer warp as you go further out. But this signature is a disk-wide phenomenon uh, and is some kind of complex response to the disk. Um, either, well, there are different models now. People say it's intrinsic. This is a natural response of the disk to, say, uh, a bar. Uh, others have argued this in terms of a strong impact uh, as, the, as one of these dwarfs, like the Sagittarius dwarf in particular, this object goes through the disk. So that was a very uh, intriguing part, and I think it brought a lot of the players together in terms of trying to understand whether this phenomenon is intrinsic to the disk or extrinsic, which you see it in an isolated system. One of the most exciting parts of the meeting actually goes to this point here now, the CDM hierarchy, accretion events, and unification. I need to remove this now because it gets... Um, Oh, no, I don't need to. I don't need to. So uh, for many years, a number of people in this audience have been doing like all-sky photometric surveys, like with the Sloan telescope, and noticing that this smooth galaxy that you see around you, there are these interesting perturbations across the sky. Uh, Heidi, in particular, had some uh, papers. In fact, she was one of the first to realize that this corrugation in stars was going on. In gas, it was also seen uh, in very early times, I should say. 
Um, but um, there has been something of a synthesis now. Um, the Cambridge group have been um, um, using RR Lyrae stars. These are stars which you can get good distances for in the halo. And they noticed, and the Gaia team also noticed, that there's been a spectacular event um, at some point between, say, six and nine billion years ago. And this is sort of, you know, more recent than a redshift of one, let's say, um, that something fell in to the galaxy. And there are many papers on bits of this stuff uh, across the sky. But there's some kind of unification happening now in the sense that they can associate lots of this detail with some kind of event. And you can physically see this. There's actually a paper by Eorio. I, I, oh, I think that's right. Eorio uh, and uh, uh, Belokorov, um, Vasily Belokorov, that you actually physically see that there really is a tilting um, stellar distribution. It gets called the sausage. Part of it is what's called sequoia. Gaia called it the Gaia Enceladus phenomenon, so maybe it's the Enceladus event. I don't know what you want to call this at some point, but it really is a substantial infall um, which has begun to emerge uh, over the past year. And it does seem to point and act in the same plane as or close to the Magellanic Clouds, not exactly. Uh, whereas this incredible Sagittarius dwarf uh, coming through the galaxy oper uh, op operates in a, in a perpendicular plane. So that synthesis of accretion events uh, is particularly uh, exciting. To keep to time, uh, I also want to mention these probes. This has been a lot of talks were focused uh, on these individual events in the halo. Uh, when, when these things are disrupting and stretching, like it could be a globular cluster, it could be a dwarf galaxy, they generate these amazing tails. And there were, um, I counted something like um, six talks on these structures. Now, there are two parts to this. One part is that it, they, in time, the globular clusters uh, and their streams and also the dwarf galaxies, in terms of their proper motions, the Gaia tel telescope is now can physically measure the movement of these things on the sky. You have a radial velocity. So you end up with six dimensions of spa phase space, eventually. You actually know how far away it is and how it's moving in three dimensions. So one of the things that's going on right now is people are trying to model these orbits in terms of the total mass of the galaxy. And it is controversial. There appear to be two crowds. If you plot, the, if you plot this in the literature, there are essentially two crowds of people. There are those that think it has a low mass and those that think it has a high mass. That's 1 times 10 to the 12 solar masses, and this is like 1.6 times 10 to the 12 solar masses. <laughs> So and I really mean that. It's sort of like the Hubble constant all over again. So depending on how people do their analyses, you end up with these two mass limits, the, the light Milky Way and the heavy Milky Way. So unlike our galactic center, known to incredible precision, the distance, the mass of the halo, and in fact how you define the halo, still remains somewhat uh, uncertain. So um, let me go on and tell you that the next part of the story, which is particularly interesting, is how these streams are being used to probe the existence of dark matter substructure. And I have a comment up here. Um, um, Anna Bonazza had this idea of, in fact, very, very dense objects. So let me just draw for you what those look like. There are at least three things that I took away from this, from the, from the various talks. So, um, so there were, they were essentially, Ray Karlberg pointed out that when you have these streams, if they form gaps in their tails, that maybe this is an interaction with a clump of dark matter. But he went on to show an amazing movie of what these, if you launch clusters of a million particles, and basically with an n-body solver, and let each of them disrupt as dynamically self-consistent systems in a halo, you end up with enormous complexity in these tails. Um, now, um, Anna Bonazza um, and um, uh, um, Sarah Pearson, their work shows that you get different effects depending on what the streams are doing. So if the stream goes through, if the stream goes through near the bar, I think it was Sarah Pearson that showed that you can have one arm being very uniform and the other one develops a little bit of complexity. Um, now, Anna Bonazza said that if one of these was to pass 
one of these very dense dark matter nuggets, you get something which looks uh, like this pushes out and looks like this, essentially. And when seen edge on, you see something like some sort of deviation from the stream. Such things, by the way, uh, have been seen. Um, and there's also a little, little bit of a gap in there as well. Um, so uh, now these nuggets that Anna talked about are pretty extreme. Um, but there's a lot of excitement about the, the work, of course. So if you were to plot the size of the object, sort of between one and a thousand parsecs, okay, um, one parsec is about the distance to the nearest star, a thousand parsecs to the nearest star cluster, group of stars. So if you were to plot this against mass, this might be 10 to the 4 solar masses. This would be 10 to the uh, uh, 9 solar masses. Um, the molecular, so let me get some numbers in here. 1, 10, and 100, like that. CDM gives you structures in here, like cold dark matter simulations give you dark matter um, distributions, power law distributions that kind of come in here, like this. Um, molecular, uh, globular clusters are down here somewhere. Uh, dwarf galaxies are kind of in here somewhere. Um, molecular clouds, at least the outer disk ones, are in here somewhere. And Anna is telling us that, in fact, to get these sorts of effects that we're seeing in these tails, you need something in here, basically in here, between 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8, as I recall from her, from her talk. So the, the whole issue of the coldness, where is, where's my point? The coldness, just how dense a nugget of dark matter can you get? It, it certainly is impressive to see that if you just posit these things exist, shove them in the halo, you can get some of the structures that you observe. I might also just mention briefly that one of the simulations or plots that was shown by Webb and Bovey is as a, a dwarf cluster or a globular cluster comes near, uh, perigee is in, in here close to the bar, you get this really incredible feathering effect going on, which um, at peri you don't see it, but you see it at, ap at apogee where it gets compressed along the orbit. So there are predictions to be, uh, that have been made about what these streams might show us in the future. So I think there's some very good forensics to be done with the tidal streams. Okay, so um, trying to get to a couple of punchlines, obviously. So let me just move on. I think I've done some of those ideas. Um, all right, so um, a brief mention about the uh, large-scale simulations. Where are we with those today? Um, so um, some very interesting work from the fire team represented here by um, uh, Andrew Wetzel and Robin Tanson, and they were being used in very uh, impressive ways, I might say. Uh, on the one hand, they're trying to form things that you would say are analogs of synthetic analogs of the Milky Way. And of course, because you have the whole cosmological story, um, basically you're able to identify individual points in its history when it accreted large objects, which of course we want to associate uh, with these new accretion events. One thing you do learn from those simulations, which really struck me, is there's no point saying, asking the question, what is a Milky, Ana uh, Milky Way analog look like before a redshift of five? Before a redshift of five, it's like a bunch of clumps, the mass of the LMC or the SMC. It's very fragmented. So it, it is an amazing statement because even now we can observe back to redshift to five, six, seven, hopefully beyond with James Webb. Um, and, um, we, and, and already we have this problem of how do we associate anything that we observe with any galaxy uh, at high redshift? That's always a problem. But the problem remains even at low redshift. When, uh, when Andrew and colleagues go off and produce Milky Way analogs, it's very hard to ask whether we ask, answer the question whether we really are seeing something which resembles or has the right sort of formation history with what we observe. But I am impressed by the analogs that are being created. They, they do have some features uh, that you can associate uh, with the Milky Way. And in fact, local group analogs like M31 Milky Way pairings, which are very common throughout the local universe. Um, I was particularly impressed on a cosmological sense by what Robin uh, Sanderson's been doing because um, she, she 
if you go back to the CDM era of KITP meeting, people realize that if you want to start looking for baryonic acoustic oscillations in, uh, in galaxy surveys, you have to divide out your window function, divide out large scale structure, and so on and so forth, and only then do you start to see these wiggles in the power spectrum. CMB is a different story, but for, for, for seeing it in the galaxy patterns, you need to divide out your window function and have simulations that you can select in the same way that you observe. So Robin's pretty much doing the same thing right now with his simulations of the galaxy taken from the simulation, cosmological simulations and asking what we see uh, in these synthetic universes, does it represent what we see in the galaxy? So this is going to be a very important part. Something else which I noticed from the simulations is they see jitter everywhere. The baryons, doesn't matter where you look, small or big galaxies, the baryons are, are jiggling around with respect to the underlying uh, dark matter potential. And this jitter is a very interesting issue because it actually means you could even imagine observing uh, small levels of acceleration uh, in the future. So I've got that under future, and I won't have time now, hope, unless it comes up in question time, about what does the future hold beyond Gaia. Anyway, uh, there was a lot of good stuff coming out of the simulations. And uh, I would say, and I hope I don't get shot down for saying this, um, if you ask the question, how good are the simulations? Uh, I've had, Lars Holmquist uh, comes twice a year to Sydney. We have this conversation. I think Lars would agree, and I hope Andrew would agree as a consequence, uh, that the, uh, you don't detect the presence of dark energy in simulations of the Milky Way. And what I mean by that, of course, dark energy slows up the accretion rate onto galaxies. But if you ask about the baronic microphysics, can you look at a Milky Way that formed in a dark energy field universe and one that didn't, it would be very hard for you to say at the present time that you need dark energy to explain the details of the Milky Way. And that's because the baronic physics, as you can imagine, uh, is so uh, complicated to install at the present time. So when you ask about new physics, you know, what new physics can we learn about the nature of, say, dark matter or even dark energy uh, dark anything, dark sector, uh, you have to keep that in mind that uh, um, there's so much more to go on the subgrid physics. Okay, so I want to get to two other issues before I close. I think I have until one o'clock, five, five minutes, good. So I'm conscious of talking too fast. Um, what's new? So um, galaxy model building uh, was an important part of the meeting as well. Um, and Catherine Johnston uh, and, and uh, Ray Carberg talked about the, the issues of building something and seeing, I think Catherine in particular, the, co the complexity, the chaotic behavior that these streams and so forth can have. But you still, um, so chaotic regimes are interesting. Maybe they're weather, maybe they're not. Maybe they're telling us something very important. But still, the issue of galaxy model building uh, is crucial. Uh, we do very well at the axisymmetric. We do nowhere near as well with the non-axisymmetric models. So model building um, has many aspects to it. The question really that came to my mind is what is the baseline model of the galaxy? And how long before the numerical simulations, cosmological simulations, can inform us, uh, as was raised by Adrian Price Whelan, uh, for a basis set that we can use to build potentials of real galaxies. So much of what we do is based on the assumption of equilibrium, that we have an equilibrium figure in 2D or in 3D. Um, and the question that was raised by several people is the assumption of equilibrium, how much does it actually hurt you? And I don't think, I don't think we know the answer. If you make the assumption of equilibrium and go forward and model, um, Christophe Pichon, I don't think he's here today. You're not here, are you, Christophe? Uh, just as well. Uh, he talks uh, in great detail about the need for um, a whole new regime of quasi-linear response. Um, and he talks about dressed Fokker-Planck equations. When I hear that, my mind starts to go numb. Uh, but it's a terrifying future if he's right. Um, so, uh, but model building, uh, we, I mentioned already the model building of the bar by Otto and Gerhardt. But model building in terms of uh, Evgeny Vasiliev talked about um, the, um, the Binney and Tremaine approach, but lays down a very nice framework in terms of genes equations and action spaces. Um, and this has now become a standard method for using uh, phase space. Um, so um, 
But all of these assumptions also are about integrable systems. This point was made by a couple of people. And are these systems truly integrable? And is the assumption of equilibrium uh, damaging or not? And so we have a long way to go before we have any real sense of how well our model building is doing, going. And I think Gaia is going to really challenge us. Monica Valuri asked the question, if the data are so good, if our models are so good, then maybe on the time scale of Gaia over the next five, maybe 10 years, we would be able to see the tumble of the entire dark halo, the, dark, the, so the whole galactic potential, sorry. You see the tumble, one radian over, over the course of um, a Hubble time. Um, and uh, it's very, very challenging indeed, especially given that the models that the Cambridge group are coming up for for this system uh, appears to have uh, a tumble on it. So we're going to have to really separate out all the different parts, accelerating parts of this complex galaxy to be sure. Um, so let me finish up. I am trying to finish up. Oh, I should be finishing up. Very good. Um, so um, I am not sure that we have arrived at a time where, the, um, where weather has taken over our field in the sense that we're collecting up all this stuff. Remember the, the, uh, the debate about DNA versus junk DNA. You know, we used to think junk DNA was useless. Let's get rid of it. And of course, it turns out that junk DNA has a lot of important DNA in it. Uh, it's the same with us. We collect up all these measurements, all this stuff. I'm sure particle physics is no different. And in some point, uh, someone comes up with a framework. We go back over these enormous data sets, and we see that it, for, it gives us a consistent framework. And I think the Enceladus event uh, over the last year is a good example of, of, of that kind of thing. So I don't think we've reached the point of weather at the present time. So much of what we're seeing is a response of a system. Of course, if you test, want to test a system, you have to uh, excite it in some way. And those, those modes of excitation tell you a great deal about how the system operates. Um, I think I had uh, another point to make on that. Um, so what are the three rungs? You've got this ladder of uh, knowledge or understanding um, I don't know how one does this, how one says this for sure. When I go and ask the simulators, uh, when are you going to give up? You know, when are you going to pack your bags and go home? And there's a wonderful story that, uh, that, um, that Carlos Frank had published a media article saying that galaxy formation was solved. Uh, and the following year, he applied for grant funding. And his referee said, well, if it's solved in the media, why should we fund you? <laughs> and I heard that from several people. I'm sure it's true. Um, but of course, uh, Carlos has gone forward and made lots of and done lots of other important work, um, and since that time. So, um, so the issue of solving galaxy formation, there are essentially possibly two or even three phases. There's baryonic microphysics, no missing ingredients. That'll take a long time. There's the dark sector, no missing ingredients, not like dark energy, but dark partic matter particles. And then finally, I think Avi Loeb would agree that even biosignatures on life might be an important part of future simulations. Thank you. Uh, if you think about the future of our galaxy, yeah. do you expect it to become more axisymmetric or less axisymmetric? And does the uh, inflation or cosmological constant play any role in that? There are people that do these write these papers. I actually think Avi Loeb was the first, and they call it Milkometer, when Milky Way and Andromeda merge. So if you search on that word, milk, milk, do I have that right? Andromeda, Milkometer, that's right. Then, so basically, that forms a spheroidal system. It doesn't look disc, uh, it might not look disc-like at all. So, um, and that may not have much residual uh, rotation. So there's a long history of people claiming that ellipticals and ellipsoidal spheroidal galaxies are built from disks. Disks dominate. The universe makes the disks very well indeed. And essentially everything is disk-like. Um, and over the course of time, it, I mean, <laughs> it just frowns. Well, no, disks, surely. Our own surveys show us that disks... All right, so, so no. What was the answer again? More or less. So, well, they're, they're rare. Massive galaxies are very rare objects compared to disks. Disks are everywhere. You can't disagree with that. But the gamma survey alone shows. Disks spheres are both axisymmetric, so Sorry? it doesn't address this question. Disks and spheres are both axisymmetric. So, so well, you can, you can be triaxial. You can have three axes, depending on how these disks merge, if they're, they're of comparable mass. So all bets are off. It might give you uh, uh, an axis of rotation, a slow axis, like a slow rotator, 
uh, or it might be a giant Traxial spheroid. I don't think that story has changed since Hernquist and so forth. So as someone who's a complete outsider from the... the, the, the You're very welcome to. Well done. I'm glad. <laughs> on the right-hand side, um, you sort of say, well, when you look at all the ingredients we need to have to, to model galaxy formation, yeah. you say there are no missing ingredients. No, no. That's my... So, sorry, I didn't make it clear. When do we say it's solved when there's no missing ingredients? So that's, that's not happened yet. Oh, okay. I apologize. So, so if you look at one of those... So, for example, uh, if you look at sort of the dark matter sector... Um, what do we sort of need to still learn to be able to, to model these things? Where is sort of the state of the art in, in that part of your field? Yeah. Well, if you made, you know, is it a, de uh, a degenerate fermion is the response. I'm hoping that all these resonances will get us to the point where we rule out um, other particle physics, um, um, mond-like mon gravities <coughs> and all the rest of it. Um, so that... But, you know, people have talked about ultralight dark matter, haven't they? Um, you know, that the halo is a, a quantum mechanical Bose, on, uh, Bose fluid, you know, and ultralight particle physics is, is uh, I think it's hard to rule out. That, one, of the, one of the predictions it does make is that you don't have um, clumps of dark matter below 10 to the 7 solar masses. So if we find low, it, the power spectrum keeps going up and up and up, does anybody here want to say, astronomers want to say whether we do have a detectable power spectrum below 10 to the 7? Do, can we say that categorically, or are we seeing tightly stripped things as they fall in? So we don't know the answer. But um, so, um, so my response to that is that uh, astronomers are particularly good at allowing for th things that become truth. We were very good at accepting dark energy instantly. Uh, we were very good at accepting um, um, certain things that were laid down by particle physics over many years. So that the halos are non-baryonic, for one thing. So you tell us, and we'll try to get it into the models and see if, if the universe looks better. I hardly like, like to accuse you of underestimating the Australian contribution. I think you have done that. <laughs> Where have I mentioned Australia in any of this? I think you should have mentioned Agris Kalnice, because I think oh, right. he really was the first to convince us that this phenomenon of resonances in the local solar neighbourhood might have detectable implications. Dean certainly deserves the credit for finding them, but I think Kalmas's paper was widely not believed. Yeah. And it was, in many cases, a very premonitory paper. Absolutely right. Agris Kalmas. Yeah, he's uh, someone that's very elusive, like certain Australian marsupials. You go and look for him. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, a, he's a tremendous. Him and, of course, Alain Toumre have a long history of friendship going back to their childhood. So they really... Um, I, I totally agree with that statement. I, I haven't had a chance to... <laughs> give you the full history. Great. Okay, thank you.